valley. The Lord, that is Yahweh, said to Gideon, The people who are with you are too many for me to give Midian into their hands, for Israel would become boastful, saying, My own power has delivered me. Now therefore, come, proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, Whoever is afraid and trembling, let him return and depart from Mount Gilead. So 22,000 people returned, but 10,000 remained. Then the Lord said to Gideon, The people are still too many. Bring them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. Therefore it shall be that he of whom I say to you, This one shall go with you, he shall go with you. But every one of whom I say to you, this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, You shall separate everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, as well as everyone who kneels to drink. Now the number of those who lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, was three hundred men. But all the rest of the people kneeled to drink water. Now, as we think about these verses, let me remind you that only the Lord God does the separating. Friend, I want you to be reminded that just as Satan came into a meeting with God in the Old Testament book of Job, before Satan could touch Job, God had to give him permission. Before Satan could touch this world with this incredible disease known as coronavirus, God had to give him permission. Let me remind you this day that our God is always in control. Whether it's chaotic or confusing or we cannot see our way out, our God is never surprised. We may have to call an emergency meeting. We have, may have to call a state of an emergency, but God never has to call a state of an emergency because God is always in control. Pray with me again. Lord God, in Jesus' name, I pray that you bless the reading of your word and be with us today as we look at these verses. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, as we look at this passage of Scripture, we're looking at the Lord's declaration. In Judges, especially concerning Gideon, he makes five declarations that we will look at, and then we'll focus on the last one. He says in Judges chapter 6, verses 1 through 10, I am the Lord your God. This is a famous I am passage of scripture. He says in Judges 6, 11 through 27, the spirit of the Lord is with you. And then in Judges 6, 28 through 35, he says the spirit of the Lord comes upon his people. We have ever need the spirit of the Lord. We need it today. And then in Judges 6, 36 through 40, he says the spirit of the Lord answers his people. I believe that when you and I pray to God, God will answer us one way or the other. He'll say yes, or he'll say no, or he'll say, wait upon me. I never want to be legalistic in any form or fashion. However, I do believe that just as it says in the New Testament, Jesus fulfills the law. And so I do believe that every Christian human being lives by the law of God. And those that are not living by the law of God will be judged by the law. But as Jesus fulfills the law, then we move into the air of grace. I would rather be a human being than an angel because angels only get one shot. They're either for God or against God. You and I, by the, by the law, we are defined as sinners. But by grace, we know that God demonstrates his love toward us. That while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans chapter 5 verse 8. I want to live by grace. And I want to know that the Spirit of God is speaking. Isaiah 59, 2 says that our iniquities have separated between us and God, that he cannot see us and he cannot hear us. Now, we know that God sees all things, hears all things, that he's everywhere all the time. And so we know that practically what this scripture means is that if we have unconfessed, unrepented of sin, we're not in a position to hear from God. I pray that that's not you nor myself. That we would find ourselves in these days in positions to hear from God. God's people need to hear from God. And the world needs to hear from God. They need to know that there's hope. And our only hope is Jesus Christ. And so as we think about the Spirit of the Lord answering His people, 
Judges 6, 36 through 40, please pray as never before. Please use these times, these hours that you have at home with your family, number one, to pray. Number two, to get into God's Word. And then number three, to lead your family. Use this time productively for the Lord and take responsibility and allow God to be profitable to you physically as well as mentally and spiritually. And then the last, number five, Judges chapter 7, ultimately verses 1 through 18, he says, do what you do for the Lord. So whether you go to work this week or whether you stay at home, whether you go to school this week or you stay at home, whether we're in Lifeline Baptist Church's building or we are the church out in our public and out in Little Rock and Central Arkansas, let's do what we do for the Lord. Let's always do what we do for the Lord. As we think about this, do what we do for the Lord, Judges 7, 1 through 18, we're going to talk about four things. Let me break them down for you this morning. Number one, we're going to talk about the boasting, Judges 7, 1 through 3. Number three, we're going to talk about the testing, Judges 7, 4 through 6. And then number three, we're going to talk about the delivery, Judges 7, 7 through 8. Let me say to you, dear friend, our Lord God, Jesus Christ, will deliver us from this current age one way or the other. And Jesus will deliver us from this day of disease and sickness and virus one way or the other. You may be sitting where you're at thinking, well, I have cancer, or I need a kidney, or my children have lost their job, or I do not know how I'm going to pay my bills, or I've lost my job myself. Let me say to you, dear friend, our Lord God, Jesus Christ, will deliver. And then number four, as we look at these verses, Judges 7, 9 through 18, we're going to talk about the arising. I love this passage of Scripture. In Judges chapter 7, we see the prophetic messianic picture of Jesus Christ, and we will at last focus on this word, arising. Jesus rose from the dead. Now, Jesus has always been God. John 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word is God. Jesus has always been God. But God, in creation, became creation as a human being, as a man, a sinless man. He lived his life without sin and went to a cross to become your sin and mine, was buried in somebody else's tomb. But three days later was raised from the dead, giving us resurrection power. Resurrection power over sin, resurrection power over death, and resurrection power to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. And friend, let me say to you, we need that power. And this power is stronger than any affliction that can come upon man, because this power comes from God. That's why I always say I want to be a Romans 10-9 Christian. I want to do more than just believe that there's a God, as the demons in hell believe that there's a God. I want to trust Him to be the Lord or the boss of my life. And I pray that you have as well. As we think about that today, let's talk about the boasting in chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. Then Jerubal, that is Gideon, remember that he's named Jerubal because God allowed him to tear down the altar to Baal. And so Joash, his dad, renamed him Jerubal. Not only did he tear down the altar to Baal, but there was an Asherah bow next to that altar, and God allowed him to cut it down, and they made kindling out of it, and he burned it on the altar. Now, he had made Satan good and angry, but he had a God that could, could deliver him, unlike the God of Baal, the lowercase G-O-D, he needed to be delivered by a human being. You and I serve a God that can deliver us. And so Gideon is renamed Jerubal because he tore down the altar of Baal. I wonder how many altars we've made. How many idols do we have? How many of them need to be burned upon an altar today? And as we look, God has always judged sin. And friend, let me say to you, God will always judge sin. The Old Testament, especially Exodus and Deuteronomy, teaches us that God is a jealous God. And He will have no gods before Him. He will not tolerate any other altar than the one that He's prepared for you and I to meet Him in at the foot of the cross for the Christian. And in the Old Testament, they had to have a faith that would fast forward, that God was going to deliver them, not only from the Midianites, the Ishmaelites, but from Satan. I have that faith. And as we think about Gideon, he's called Jeru 
and early and camped beside the spring of Herod. The camp of Midian was on the north side of them, by the hill of Moriah in the valley. And the Lord said to Gideon, I've never heard the Lord the way that Gideon heard the Lord that day. I prayed that I would. I hear God in my head, and I hear God in my heart. I hear God through other people. And then I confirm it in the book. I do not believe that the Word of God is mysterious. I do believe that the Word of God will change our lives if we will allow God to speak to us through it. And verse 2 says, The Lord said to Gideon, The people who are with you are too many for me to give to Midian into their hands, for Israel would become boastful, saying, My own power has delivered me. Now therefore, come and proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, Whoever is afraid and trembling. Sounds like our world today, doesn't it? There are those that are boastful, there are those that are afraid, and there are those even this day that are trembling. Let him return and depart from Mount Gilead. So 22,000 people return, but 10,000 remain. Let's talk about boasting. As we think about boasting, sometimes even as pastors, we begin to refer to the church as our people. No person belongs to another. People belong to God or they do not belong to God. God makes all people. But as we reminded in John's Gospel, chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father. My wife, my children, my family, they do not belong to me. Lifeliners do not belong to me. They're not my people. We are the people of God. And we should never be boastful or prideful enough or arrogant enough to think that people belong to us because they do not. I can almost guarantee you that every relationship today that has a problem, and most relationships are problematic, that they have a problem because they try to be possessive of the people in their life. Instead of trusting God with those people, they begin to trust those people. People are going to let us down. But God never lets us down. And we want to trust people to God, not to ourselves. Not even as a husband and a wife, especially as a mother or a daddy. We cannot do that. People belong to God. And Judges chapter 7 verses 1 uses the phrase, my people, instead of the Lord's people. And then number 2, my word instead of the Lord's word. Look at verse 2. The Lord said, that is a Hebrew Old Testament word that reminds me that the Lord speaks not only did he speak everything to him, into creation, he brings judgment and he speaks salvation. He allows us to have a relationship to him. But we need to focus on God's word and not my word, not your word. America does not need to hear your word or my word or anybody else's word. America today needs to hear the word of God. I know men and women and young men and women that do not know Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And they're petrified as they look around them. They do not need to hear my word. They do not need me to assure them or to give them comfort. That comfort needs to come from God and God alone, God's word. <clears throat> Notice then my power instead of God's power. Judges also chapter 7 verse 2. He says, for my own power has delivered me. God was fearful that Israel would become boastful or arrogant or prideful. And so he did not want them to think that they had delivered themselves. He wanted them to know beyond a reasonable shadow of a doubt they could never deliver themselves. Gideon could not deliver himself. God can deliver. And so we think about God's power. We need resurrection power. And then notice verse 3. Now therefore, come and proclaim in the hearing of all the people, saying, Whoever is afraid and trembling, we need a proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so as we think about the proclamation today, we're reminded that God has proclaimed in 66 books of the Bible, those of the Old Testament, those of the New Testament, there's never going to be another book added to the canon. The canon has been closed. God's given us enough information and proclamation to take us from here to eternity. And I'm ready for that day. We think about the proclamation. We're reminded in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. He says, And my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Please notice today that 
disobeyed God. God had told them to eat of every tree in the garden except for the tree of knowledge, for when they ate of it, they would surely die. But Satan, being an angel of the Spirit, took on the form of a serpent, and he deceived Adam and Eve. And he's still deceiving men and women and boys and girls today, convincing them that if they ate of the tree of knowledge, all knowledge, that eyes would be opened and they would become as gods. Well, friend, I want to say to you, as knowledgeable as we are and as thankful as I am for knowledge today, the knowledge of every doctor, of every nurse, of every pediatrician, of all those that study, I'm thankful for that knowledge. But knowledge will not deliver you. The only thing that's going to deliver you is Jesus Christ recognizing that we have a sin problem. America, the world, Little Rock, Arkansas, we are plagued with a sin problem. Notice that in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, forgiveness has to come for sins in order for there to be true healing. I must confess. The word confess is the Greek New Testament word in the New Testament, homologia, the same logic. I must be on the same logic with Jesus, that he's the Lord of my life or that he should be. And that God raised him from the dead. I want to know that Jesus has forgiven me of my sin. I don't know when I'm going to die. I don't know when the Lord's going to come back. Now I'm holding out for the rapture. But just in case, I'm ready. Now that may not mean that I want to go today. But it means that whenever God's ready for me, that I'm going to be ready. Not because I'm a Baptist. Not because I'm a preacher. But because of a, as a man, I recognize my own sin nature. And I've asked for forgiveness of sin and asked the Lord to cause me to turn from sin. And because I've said, as Romans 10, 9, God raised Jesus from the dead. And in Romans 10, 13, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm saved. And so as we think about God healing our land, we're reminded that all of us are need of healing. Jesus' half-brother James tells us that in James 5, 16. But today our land needs healing. We need to cry out to God as never before. And so we're reminded today of the proclamation of the gospel. Philippians chapter 1, verses 15 through 18 says it this way. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of a selfish ambition, rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. What then? Then there's a question. Only what in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and this, in this, I rejoice. Today we're proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are not doing this in a way that they would have been able to do it 100 years ago or 200 years ago or 2,000 years ago. We're online and people are connecting with us, not only lifeliners, but people from around our country, hopefully, are connecting with us and hearing the gospel because of the proclamation of the Word of God. Jesus is alive and well. But I'm also reminded in Philippians chapter 4, verse 5, the Apostle Paul says to the church at Philippi, let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Let me remind you today, dear friend, wherever you're at in your walk of life, the Lord is near. And if you're a Christian, let your spirit be known. But let it be a gentle spirit. These are days when we're going to have to be more patient than we've ever been. That's difficult for me and probably for many of you. We're going to have to have a gentle spirit to get through these days. And just like in the New Testament church, following the resurrection of the Lord, the apostles, the disciples, and the early church had to band together and share what they had. Share what they had to get along, to merely survive. It's time for Christian men and women and boys and girls to think about those days. We're going to have to share not only through prayer and the Word of God, but probably everything that we have. But remember, the Lord is near. Now verse 6 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Be anxious for nothing. 
This is the Greek New Testament word that reminds us of, reminds us of our English word worry. Let me remind you today, it is a sin to worry. It is a sin to worry. There's an old song that says, instead of counting sheep, you can't sleep to count your blessings. But I want to say to you today, when you lay your head down, when you get up in the morning, after or during your watching of the news, let me remind you that if we pray, God will take care of our anxieties and our worries. And through prayer, God will remind us of His Word. Find your soul as your comfort in the Word of God and in the people of God. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. Now we get to the testing. Now we know that in James chapter 1, verse 13 and following, that the Bible says that our God cannot be tested or tempted. But let me remind you that before Satan came upon Job, he had to have God's permission. Many people, most scholars, will credit Job with the oldest book in the Bible. Notice that Job begins the story of a man who had been found right or with favor in the sight of God. Job was by no stretch of the imagination without sin. But God allowed Satan to test Job. And let me say to you today as we think about the testing, we begin reading in Judges chapter 7 verse 4. Then the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. Bring them down to the water and I will test them for you there. I will test them for you there. Even in this battle as they prepared to take over the Midianites. Gideon could not depend upon himself. He had to wait upon the Lord to speak to them and to him. You bring them and I will test them. Friend, never be guilty of trying to test another individual. Because surely when you do, those individuals will fail. While we trust God with people instead of trusting people. But never be guilty of testing another individual. That's why the Bible says, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I do not worry about those that are with me or even those that are against me. Because God says, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I can't test and I can't repay anybody. In fact, I have to forgive those that sin against me. As the verse teaches us in the Lord's Prayer. And the Bible teaches us without forgiveness, we have to ponder and wonder our own forgiveness. Jesus says it will not happen. And so we think about the testing. So we think about the testing. Number one, it comes in three ways. The Lord's Word, Judges 7 through 4. The Lord said, I will test. We need to listen to the Word of the Lord. And then the Lord's separation, 7, 5, Judges 7, 5. So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, You shall separate everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, as well as everyone who kneels to drink. Let's allow the Lord to do our separating. Be cautious of separating yourself, not from those that may have the coronavirus or sickness or sorrow. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when you get angry or spiteful or ugly. Don't say, Well, I'm done. I'm through lifeliners know that that's one of my least favorite statements. Let God do the separating. And then the Lord's number, Judges 7, 6. Now the number of those who laughed. Sometimes we say that there's no significance in numbers. Friend, every number represents a person. And every person represents a life. And God's made that life. And every life is precious to God. And every life is to the people around you in one way or the other. You may be sitting today watching this service on Facebook and you may be sitting there by yourself. Your life is precious to God. And your life is precious to me and to Lockline Baptist Church. 
God be for me, who can be against me? I'm reminded of God's word through the Apostle John in 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. Greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. If you find yourself in this period of testing, not only for the world, for the United States, for Little Rock, Arkansas, and you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I want to tell you that Romans chapter 1 verse 20 says that there's no one without excuse. We should look at the sun, the moon, and the stars and know that there's a God. It's a general revelation. You've heard three times so far this morning specific revelation. I've shared with you that Jesus lived and died and was raised from the dead, buried in a borrowed tomb, ascended, walking on earth, and one day he's coming back to the church. You've heard specific the gospel. Also, let me remind you that we talked about sin. The reason that sorrow and sickness and separation comes upon us is because of our sin nature traced back to Adam and Eve. And so Romans 3.10 says there's none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's pretty gloomy. It's pretty gloomy. It's like today. We could look out and say, Well, it even looks sick outside. It's gray, cloudy, rainy. But friend, let me say to you, for the Christian, our best days are ahead. Jesus is alive and well. And we do have a verse of hope. Romans 5 8. God demonstrates his love toward us. That while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. Which is good. Because then we get to one of the most horrific passages of Scripture of all. Romans 6 23. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. God didn't do this. It's going on in our world. But God has allowed it to happen. I think so that we will wake up. I pray so that we will wake up. I beg God so that we will wake up. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. That's good news. Right where you're at today, Romans 8, 16 says that God's spirit will bear witness with your spirit, whether you're not you're a child of God, but God speaks to you. Remember God's word. You don't want to listen to me or anybody else. Listen to God today. And then, Romans 10, 9. If you've never asked Jesus to be the Lord or the boss of your life, would you do that today? Would you say to him, I do believe that God raised you from the dead on the resurrection power over sin, over death, and the power to live through him? And then ultimately, we do that through Romans 10, 13, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you've never been saved, would you ask Jesus Christ right now in your day and your heart to be your personal Lord and Savior, to be your boss? Would you say to him, I'm tired of playing God. I'm tired of being my own boss. I'm tired of anxiety and fear. I want to quit trembling unless your spirit is on me today. I want you to save me. Not only do I want you to forgive me of my sin, but I want you to cause me to turn from my sin. I want to repent. I want to be born again as Nicodemus talked to Jesus. Born from above. Born and new. And today is my day of salvation. Lord God in Jesus' name. I do believe that God raised you from the dead. Save me right now. Please save me right now. You prayed that prayer today. Jesus says in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 10. If you're not willing to confess it before man, you will not be willing to confess you before his body is in heaven. If you prayed that prayer, please let us know. Contact us on Facebook or you can contact the website. Please let us know. Do five things for Jesus if you were saved today. Pray every day. Start praying constantly. Read your Bible every day. And get with me if you do not have a Bible and we'll give you one and we'll teach you how to study God's Word. We will disciple you. One of our biggest problems is not disciple. There are plenty of rock runners now that are equipped and ready to disciple. We will disciple you. And then the third thing is I want you to tell everybody that you know that you've been saved. Going back to what Jesus said. If you're not willing to confess me before men, I'll not be willing to confess you before my Father is in heaven. And then I want you to find you a church. You're always welcome to my time. But I want you to find you a New Testament, Jesus believing, Jesus preaching church, and follow the Lord and believe his baptism. And then tell everybody that you know how to be saved. If you're out and about, they've told us how many feet should be between us to keep from getting sickness. But please talk loud enough to proclaim.
Somebody said, well, all we can do is pray. 